This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 773, recorded on June 25th, 2021. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Ann Arbor, Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. Here, it's a rainy day. Uh, it's 23 Celsius and 72 Fahrenheit at the moment. Oh, I'm so sorry. It's a beautiful day here, 26 C and sunny here in New York City. Also joining us from Madison, New Jersey, Brian Barker. Hi, it's great to be here. Um, it is equally sunny and beautiful here, unsurprisingly. Um, 81 Fahrenheit, uh, 27 Celsius, and just a lovely day. We have a very special guest today. She's also here in New York City. She is the author of The Coming Plague, recipient of the Pulitzer Prize, Lori Garrett. Welcome to TWIV. Hi. And you already said what the weather is here in New York. That's right. It's the same in Brooklyn, I suppose, right? It's a nice day. It's a nice day. So I have, we have a ton of questions uh, for you. This is a great time to uh, have you on. Uh, and I want to start with a little bit of your uh, history. I noticed you got a you majored in biology in college, and I'm wondering what got you interested in science? Do you know? Do you remember? Oh, I know exactly. <laughs> and, and like most people, there was uh, an event related to the medical status of people in my family. Mm. Um, I was always interested in science, but I was also interested in a million other things. I was totally unfocused and loving it. But then my mother uh, came down with cancer when I was 18 and died when I was 19. And she told me, you have to find a cure for this disease. So I was ordered, compelled by my mother <laughs> on her deathbed to change my major, go into biochemistry and make it 100% my focus. Huh. So before that, what were you majoring in? And who knows? I was, <laughs> it was kind of theater and kind of political science. Okay. Mainly, I was majoring in stopping the Vietnam War. Got it. Got it. Okay. Well, the politics have pursued you. You can't escape them in science, right? Yeah. So then you, you did you did enter grad school, but decided to do science writing, right? And I'm wondering, uh, how did that happen? Well, I was at Berkeley in the Department of Bacteriology and Immunology, and totally saw myself ending up as a bench scientist doing some kind of basic immunology work. I was very interested in, at the time, in two things, um, fluorescence activated cell sorters. So I worked with the Hertzenbergs at Stanford on that. And uh, timely that that was developed and the capacity to isolate living T4 and T8 cells immediately preceded the arrival of HIV. So we were able, not me personally, but we as scientists were able to say, this is the key to HIV is its devastation of T4 cells, um, CD4 cells. Um, but then... Uh, the problem was that my department was really a mess at Berkeley. There, the faculty were kind of at each other's throats. And a lot of the grad students were deeply frustrated. We were having trouble even getting sufficient numbers of faculty to show up for essential meetings that are, you know, key landmark points for grad school. And, um, and I felt like uh, really frustrated that I couldn't, get any clear mentor direction or, or anything really. And uh, eventually my mentor at the time, Leon Wofsey said, uh, you know what, why don't you, why don't you take a leave of absence while we sort this mess out and uh, come on back when we've got it sorted, which is then I went to do science writing and science journalism and broadcasting and I never went back and there is no department to go back to now. So I am forever without my PhD. <laughs> so, so how did you choose that science to do science writing and science journalism at that point? What drew you in that direction and how did you get into it? So um, 
like most college students, I lived with multiple roommates and uh, one of them was being courted by a fellow who was the news director of the local, one of the local radio stations. And whenever he was waiting for her to show him attention, he would deign to speak with me and, uh, <laughs> and I would speak science. And he started saying, you know what, you do a really good job explaining this stuff. Why don't you come do it on the radio? And that's literally how it happened. But at the same time, HIV AIDS was erupting. And so that must have played a role also, right? Well, this is before HIV AIDS. Okay. I mean, uh, I'm older than you think. Uh, this was uh, <laughs> late 70s. And okay. uh, so the big stories of the day were swine flu, mm. uh, toxic shock syndrome, the very first Ebola epidemic, uh, and an, an assortment of other you know, less well-known crises that occurred in that period. And the the public humiliation of the director of the CDC over the future of the swine flu fight mm. and the sense that it was all a fiasco, a debacle, a complete failure by the U.S. government. And so that was the backdrop. That and the dawn of the age of genetic engineering, mm. um, and the, the big the big meetings like Asilomar uh, that were the classic points at which uh, scientists said, let's put the brakes on this kind of activity and this kind of activity, but this other set of experimental modalities are okay, they're safe, uh, let's set ethical parameters on what we do. And the idea of scientific self-regulation now you look at it, it seems so naive. You know, it seems so sweet. All oh, the good old days when when a relative handful of white men, basically, could sit down and say, let's all agree to only do these kind of experiments. Okay. Boy, are those days gone. You bet. In fact, when I went to do a postdoc, the moratorium had just been lifted. And you could now clone entire viral genomes. And... Uh, I remember that very clearly. You know, I was in Peter Palacio's lab when the 76 fl swine flu, the few cases in Fort Dix happened. And the chair of the department was Ed Kilborn, who advised Gerald Ford to vaccinate everybody, right? And Peter said to him, no, this is just a pig virus. Don't, don't do it. It's not a human virus. But I didn't listen to him and fiasco. Well, we've gone through this over and over again. And there's, there is something about when a virus hits military personnel that mm -hmm. makes things go crazy. I would argue it has to do with the nature of threat response and analysis inside of military circles, because after spending 13 years plus uh, at the Council on Foreign Relations, I have seen up close and personal how national security people respond to threat. And it's, uh, you know, we have time to look at this threat, this threat, wait a minute, uh-oh, here hmm. comes something over on the side we weren't thinking about. Yikes! And there, it's very hard to get a response that's somewhere in between eh and yikes. Um, and in the case of, you know, the two big glaring examples of this um, in recent time would be swine flu. You know, one guy died at Fort Dix. Mm -hmm. He died on a forced march in winter, 50 mile full full uh, gear snow march. He had, he was clearly sick before he ever started marching. And uh, his uh, commanding officer refused to give him any, you know, leeway. You got to go with the rest of the guys. And he came back and he collapsed. Mm. That was the beginning of the whole fiasco. Well, similarly, uh, you flash forward into the 90s and you have at U.S. AMRIT, this is the U.S. Army Medical uh, Re Research Institute on Infectious Diseases, U.S. AMRIT. And you had uh, a, an outbreak of uh, dead monkeys in their animal colony. Hmm. And all of a sudden, they're screaming, we've got Ebola, and, you know, the whole world needs to freak out. And the CDC comes in, takes a look, and says, now, you know, no human cases of Ebola here, hmm. nothing to look at. You better clean up your animal colony. And uh, that was not the way the army responded. They yeah. turned it into a very frightening episode that turned out to be a mix of multiple viruses circulating in that lab 
uh, in that animal colony. Uh, and uh, probably some pretty serious errors made in how they were housing their mm. their animals. And it was what we now call rest and uh, Ebola, which was from the Philippines and only affects uh, old world monkeys uh, and doesn't seem to have any effect at all on human beings. You know, nevertheless, uh, maybe the military should have been in charge of pandemic response. Maybe we'd get a better <laughs> response than we did, right? <laughs> when we need an extreme response, we don't get it. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <clears throat> so um, I have to show you, this is my copy of uh, your book. I bought this shortly after it was published in the 90s. Um, and um, one of these days I have to get you to autograph it. Um, and I love it. It's just, and it's good. It's just still timely. You can still go and read it and it's exciting and everything is relevant. So if you haven't read it, uh, please go ahead and do that. So this is published in 95. Is that, is that correct? It actually, the hard copy came out in the fall of 94. Mm -hmm. And then Ebola broke out in Kikwit Zaire in uh, December of 94. And uh, the book came out to modest sales and then, I went to Zaire and was in the epidemic and all of a sudden, unbeknownst to me, because I was in Zaire where you don't see things like New York Times bestseller list, <laughs> <laughs> all of a sudden it had popped up yeah. because of the timeliness. When did you actually start working on writing it? Oh, goodness. <clears throat> I started collecting files and doing interviews and thinking about it probably 10 years before it was published. Mm. But the real impetus was when um, I felt validated. I, you know, I have to say, I thought maybe I was nuts. You know, maybe it was just me being uh, alarmist or something that I was seeing trends in, among, in the virus world that looked distressing. And that, because I was surrounded by the messaging that was the opposite, that, you know, it's all about cancer now. Hmm. We there's no reason to worry about these infectious diseases, but I had lived in Africa and had seen up close and personal on multiple treks all over sub-Saharan Africa, what measles was doing, what all these things that we thought were no big deal back in the USA were ravaging populations, especially children. And, um, and that there were, was this whole background of, mortality that was never diagnosed. You know, what was that virus? What was that bacterium? Nobody knew. Nobody bothered to look and nobody had the capacity and the laboratories to do the work because all the money was skewed to other parts of the planet. And so, uh, so I was working on it. It was in the back of my mind uh, pretty constantly, but it was really the turning point when I, I put the, uh, you know, foot to the pedal and really started working on it full, full time was when I attended the meeting organized by Josh Lederberg mm. and Steve Morse at the National Academy of Sciences. And it was uh, focused on viruses only. That was plenty. Um, looking at the question of were we seeing emergence of previously unknown viruses? And um, the the other thing that I would have to say was playing a big role in my thinking was that having been involved with witnessing HIV since before it had a name and having written about it from the very beginning in 81, I was really infuriated by just about every aspect of the HIV response. It was um, so blatantly uh, homophobic and discriminatory and filled with rage against those who suffered the disease and those who were at risk. And there were all kinds of things about it where if you just filled in a different name for the disease and a different category of people at risk, the nature of the response, both in the scientific community and the political community everywhere would have been completely different. But you know, when you say, oh, it's gay men and IV drug users, and, you know, we all are already as a society consider them the scum of the earth. And now they're getting sick and dying. And well, gee whiz, just don't let them give it to us. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a kind of exceptionalism 
about HIV that I found very distressing because the biologist in me said, look, this virus doesn't know your sexuality. This virus doesn't know your race. This virus doesn't know anything. This is just a virus. And the very same things that made this particular virus emerge and take advantage of what one set of what we could call amplifying events, in this case, uh, bathhouses, needle sharing, prog- needle sharing among IV drug users, um, you know, key, key ways, a hu- forms of human behavior that amplified the spread of what we now know was a very, very, very rare virus, but was in the human population before then. Um, I thought, well, you know, that amplification factors exist in ways that humans aid and abet viruses exist for all viruses. Why are we looking at this through this exceptionalist as if it wasn't a harbinger of things to come? And so for me, by the time the meeting happened at the National Academy of Sciences, I already felt rather firmly that I had to find a way to frame what what had happened with the emergence of HIV in a larger context Mm. that de-exceptionalized it and said, you know, pay attention regardless of your sexuality, regardless of how rich you are, who you think you are that's special and won't be vulnerable because there are other microbes out there that are going to find other points of social vulnerability in order to amplify and become, you know, dominant forces for other key communities. And you can't keep thinking HIV is this rare event that you can poo-poo. And, you know, the other one that had struck me that way was toxic shock syndrome. And I have to say, to this day, of all the interviews I ever did about the coming plague, fewer than four or five was I ever asked any questions about the section in the book about toxic shock syndrome? You know, I don't think, first of all, most interviewers are men, but even putting that aside, I just don't think people want to talk about vaginas. And, you know, that's very similar to they didn't want to talk about anal intercourse. And okay, you don't want to talk about it, makes you uncomfortable. Well, guess what? You're going to be vulnerable. There's going to be disease. We're going to have spread of, of microbes because things are uncomfortable to talk about. Do you think that's changed at all? Well, it's changed in the sense that um, much of the current, the the younger generation today feel, uh, not just in America, all over the world, feels that for millennia, society has been way too fixated on rigid gender Mm -hmm. issues. And there's a great deal more tolerance, if you want to use that word, tolerance on it implies that you're tolerating something that's not great, but you'll tolerate it. Um, so tolerance may not be the word, but a less discriminatory, prejudicial feeling um, around sexuality. But I don't think that uh, social attitudes towards drug users has changed one iota, mm. even though IV drug use has gotten much whiter what much more middle class in America since the early eighties. And I think our, we're still, we still really don't want to talk about modes of transmission of disease that make us uncomfortable and force us to think about hmm. um, larger social issues. Look at COVID who, who really wants to get down and dirty about why African-Americans are at special risk really wants to go into the details of what it's like to live in uh, on an American Indian reservation in in the current world and why that puts you at such extraordinary risk for COVID. Well, we do. We had Bob Fully Love on last year. He was great. And uh, I think, Brian, last week we talked about toxic shock, right, in the context of Leaky gut in uh, MISC. Right? We did. Yes, we did. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, you know, when I teach virology to my students, I make a point of saying men who, men who have sex with men, and I know some of them are uncomfortable, but this is medicine. This is science. There's no room for that. <laughs> Tell them. Anyway. So the subtitle of the book is Newly Emerging Diseases in a World Without Balance. So what, what's the world without balance part? 
world out of balance. World out of balance. Um, Sorry. Well, you know, the interesting yes. thing is, so, so after that book, um, the only real criticism I got of the coming plague, besides uh, unfavorable comparisons in some popular reviewers' minds between The Hot Zone by Richard Preston, which came out at the same time, and my book, um, because they found The Hot Zone more riveting and terrifying. And he wrote a lot about people's guts melting and so on. Um, but besides that, the, I thought credible criticism was, well, you didn't offer a set of solutions at the end. And of course, I felt very awkward about trying to do that because um, I was coming as the the observer, not the the mover and shaker. But clearly the, the issue was the strength of your public health infrastructure and its capacities to do surveillance uh, and response to an outbreak. So my second book, I spent eons researching public health systems all over the world and the whole history of how public health came to exist as an entity. And I traveled on four continents researching that book. Um, and so that's Betrayal of Trust, The Collapse of Global Public Health. And then uh, a year after that book came out, 9-11 happened. And I was in the middle of it and spent the entire time that the plume was of burning World Trade Center was enveloping the city um i was down there almost every single day and uh so i wrote and then and then the anthrax attacks uh came just uh, you know less than 30 days later and uh the combined effect of the fearfulness induced by the anthrax letters and the fearfulness induced by the al-qaeda attacks on um uh, three different locations in the United States, um, you know, really transform both public health and our national government and our whole national psyche. We became a securitized nation. And so I felt like the public health dimensions of both the anthrax and the content of the burning plume overwhelming our city and then the nature and resilience of the response of New Yorkers uh, in the first year after all of it uh, had been completely overlooked. So for my third book, it was taking the whole concept of public health and asking how did it meet the challenge of a really, you know, enormous double header, you know, crisis that had clear double decker national security implications and what happened when the national security apparatus, the FBI, CIA, et cetera, comes head on head against, you know, traditional, rather meek public health. And so that was, I heard the sirens scream, how Americans responded to the 9-11 and anthrax attacks. And I think if you take those three books as a continuum, what you end up with is, um, the beginning in the 80s and 90s of understanding that uh, there were many ways that we had were severely disrupting our natural environs, the ecology we lived in, whether it was Jim Hansen's first, you know, historic speech to Congress saying there is global warming um, or and warning of climate change, or it was uh, the loss of biodiversity and the devastation of rainforests going on all over the world, we were seeing the sort of natural environment of host species disrupted and allowing for the emergence of the microbes that were hitchhiking in them and putting us at risk. And the logical fail-safe mechanism for our species would be organized public health with appropriate toolkit, appropriate financing, handling real genuine surveillance and response. Why didn't that happen? And how do we know it didn't succeed? Because look what a mess they made of the anthrax attacks. Look what a horrible mess they made of fa failure to really track what happened uh, 
to the uh, people of New York who were exposed to the burning chemical soup that came out of what had been the World Trade Center. And now, you know, you flash all the way forward from there, you go through swine flu uh, again in 2009, you go through 2003 SARS, you go through multiple Ebola outbreaks, um, and the, the rise of unbelievable forms of plasmids that carry now resistance factors for, you know, huge families of antibiotics all at once so that a microorganism that we traditionally could scoff at uh, now becomes utterly incurable with our armamentarium. And you flash forward to where we are now with COVID and, and you can see a continuum of both success and failure, success and failure that starts all the way back with the arrival of HIV in the 80s and takes us to today. I'm wondering if you have... Uh, since you've been so familiar with pandemic possibilities and preparedness for so long, if for COVID-19 there were any surprises for you, good or bad? Oh, yeah. I mean, the biggest surprise, because I've been in so many role-playing uh, things where, you you know, you your uh, people are playing out how would they respond if a microbe suddenly surfaced and you bring in mayors and governors and what have you. Um, no role playing event, no scenario plan, no pandemic preparedness plan anywhere. Imagine that the major liar and the major contributor to distortion would be the head of state. None of us ever imagined, you know, a Jair Bolsonaro a uh, uh, Donald Trump, a uh, earlier phase Boris Johnson, um, you know, a Duterte, you go down the list. We've just seen, um, we've seen a scale of obfuscation, of uh, failure to respond, of lies and distortions from the top levels of societies that just far exceeded anything I would ever have imagined. No dystopian nightmare I ever had before 2020 imagined this kind of thing. And keep in mind, I was in the middle of SARS in 2003 in China in a lying government. I saw it up close and personal. And I, I just never imagined my own government would be worse than that. Yeah, but are there, what is the problem with properly dealing with public health? Why lie about it? Why can't we just take care of people? Is there some fundamental reason? Yeah, there's several. Actually, today, the CDC released a survey of some, I believe it was 25,000 plus public health workers nationwide showing that they have um, suicidal ideations, acute um, psychological distress, de depression, and PTSD at rates that are far above the general society mm -hmm. and well above uh, hospital employees, even those that were directly dealing with COVID. Um, and I think that didn't surprise me one bit, but I'm sure for a lot of people, the idea that somebody who does contact tracing would have a more acute um, psychological response to the epidemic than somebody who's trying to save lives in the ER might seem shocking. Um, look, first of all, before there was germ theory, there was public health, but it was in the form of, uh, you know, the sanatorium to isolate the infected and the something kind of vaguely thought of as a doctor uh, you know, coming with whatever was their poultice or their recommendation for dealing with plague or leprosy or whatever disease it was. Um, and, you know, nobody had a clue what to do with a virus. They didn't understand what a virus was. Frankly, I think when there's been, there was a lot of hand-waving comparison of the 1918 influenza and the early stages of our COVID pandemic, and uh, I found most of it very unuseful and unhelpful. And a lot of it reflected a complete ignorance about what actually happened in 1918. But the key point it all missed is that in 1918, humanity knew almost zero about viruses. 
Hmm. He certainly didn't understand anything about how a virus reproduced and what was the relationship between the virus and the host. And, you know, barely had inklings of how it spread. You know, what was this thing? It was, it was just kind of ephemera, you know, the miasma theory, just slightly better than Hippocrates would have written about it in ancient Greece. Um, and, uh, I guess I felt that um, that illustrated a set of principles of what we've dealt with public health all down the line. So, I mean, in the early days, when you have a hero like Herman Biggs, who created the first true municipal department of health in the world in New York City uh, at the turn of the 20th century, based on germ theory, um, using laboratory confirmation of infection, the first really, you know, government powered use of germ identification and confirmation as a way to create social tools for limiting spread of disease um, with heavy emphasis in those days on tuberculosis. When you have that system arise, it, it isn't very long in every single place where public health came to exist before you see attention, first of all, with organized medicine that says, shut up, you're scum, we hate you, you're, you're taking away our customers, you're impeding our superior intellect and our pursuit of individualistic care. And, you know, we, you know, you have, just get out of our face. Don't talk to our patients. Don't, don't interfere in any way. So, you just go around the world and look at what is the school of public health? It's some stucco building with, you know, collapsing infrastructure. A next door out of solid marble will be the medical school. Um, and that differential it goes through pay scale, power, everything up the entire tree uh, professionally. So that uh, you look at the folks that, have their PhDs in public health, they're incredible, say, statistician, they sit in a city health office with no windows, surrounded by metal furniture, getting paid maybe $60,000, $70,000 a year, and, um, and some MD who's a radiologist can come in and start screaming at them and telling them, I'm smarter than you. That tension continues today. We've seen it play out here in New York City when our whole health department leadership was axed by the mayor and the Health and Hospitals Corporation was put in charge of co contact tracing and our whole public health response. And now the driver's seat is completely uh, organized, powerful medicine in the city. And public health has been essentially destroyed. About 30% of public health professionals have left the city health department. Uh, since the arrival of COVID. And, um, you know, we, we've just seen the best Department of Health in the world devastated. Um, the second thing is it's about money. So when an essential tool to stop an outbreak involves anything that will imperil the flow of cash, there are vested interests that don't want that flow of cash to stop. And whether the flow of cash is shipping flea infested sheep from Genoa to Venezia or the flow of cash is, you know, shutting down stock exchanges and, you know, the, the trade and commerce um, and bars and, and restaurants, whatever it might be, uh, it's it does it. It's just really hard for this relatively weak infrastructure we call public health to stand up to trillions of dollars of, uh, you know, business interests, commerce interests, trade interests, and, and even small businesses. Yeah, that was part of the narrative in this pandemic as well, get businesses back open again, right? It's all about yeah, well, Everybody wants it open and you can't blame them. Yeah. Nobody likes being shut down and lots of people, it can be argued, have suffered the health effects of essentially rapidly induced poverty. Yeah. And that is certainly the case across the African continent where uh, I was recently in a high level meeting 
uh, where they were crunching the numbers and the estimate is that development in sub-Saharan Africa has been pushed backwards by 20 years due to COVID response. Yeah. So, so how do we actually strengthen public health? You talk about some of the places where public health maybe isn't as strong. So what should we do to actually change that? Yeah, I mean, God, I've spent so much time trying to sort that problem out. So here's the thing. First of all, the term public health itself is not a universally um, interpreted term. So in a lot of the wealthy world, public health means taxpayer-supported health care. It doesn't mean clean water, clean air, uh, inspecting restaurants, uh, responding to outbreaks. It means the king ordered a health infrastructure and from the top down, you know, call it Health France, call it National Health Service in the UK, whatever you may be. These were all constructs that came from the highest levels of royalty and got imposed down to the provincial level from the top. And they from the very beginning mixed healthcare delivery with you know, some notions of public health. Here in the United States, we're exactly the opposite. Public health arose from the grassroots up. You can cross county lines and the laws are different. You cross state lines and the laws are way different. And federal authority over public health is quite minimal in the United States. The CDC can't tell New York what to do. It may try. <laughs> and some CDC scientists may get into a screaming match with some New York scientists. That, in fact, is quite common. But they can't actually com command New York to do anything. So, in fact, the CDC can only enter a state by the invitation of state authorities. Mm. It has to be asked in formally. Um, and the same is pretty much true when you go to the international level. You know, WHO can't set foot in any country without an invitation. Contrary to the myths promulgated by some members of our political hierarchy, WHO doesn't have the power to walk into China and tell them what to do, or to any other country for that matter. And um, we don't have any sort of overarching infrastructure that plays that role. So how do we make public health more powerful? How do we make it better funded and more consistently funded? Not on this roller coaster of, you know, the mayor and the city council are scared. Here's more money. We're not scared anymore. The money's going to the fire department. Now we're scared again. Here's some money. Oops, we're not scared anymore. And that's true on every, every tier you know, from the city all the way to the international level. How do we get consistent, stable funding, a recognition of the profession outside of the profession itself, um, a, a rigid set of standards for everything from essential surveillance all the way through to the nature of your modeling systems, your use of artificial intelligence to crunch data to determine what my trends might be in there and all that. How, how do we improve the whole status of the multinational infrastructure of response and containment in public health, WHO, Gavi, you know, the Global Fund, the list is long. And, um, you know, I would say the problem that we face ultimately is that public health is a very timid profession, very timid. It rests on an army of skilled personnel who for the most part have thankless jobs that involve protecting hundreds of thousands of people at once. So it's really quite extraordinary. An MD in their life, you know, let's say a, a cardiac surgeon in, in his or her life might save, oh, I don't know, 500 lives, maybe 10,000 lives. They have a super high productivity medical setting. You know, a person with only a master's degree in public health that knows how to do their job with water sanitation may save 
hundreds of millions of lives in their lifetime. But we skew the power and the funding and the respect towards that cardio, cardiac surgeon, mm. not towards the poor schmuck that sits in the windowless office, making sure that every time I drink from my tap, this is safe. Mm. You mentioned CDC, um, so they cannot, they can only make recommendations. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, guidelines. Guidelines, okay. Guidelines. So, so early in the pandemic, they said, don't wear masks, right? And people listened. And then when they changed their mind, people said, why did you change your mind? So they're kind of hamstrung, aren't they? Well, on the mask issue, I mean, I also early on was saying, why in the world would you wear a mask outdoors? And mm -hmm. we have only so many N95 masks. Let's make sure they go to the health providers. Um, but that was based on my experience with SARS, which was very, very different. I mean, it was a, also a coronavirus, but in terms of its um, likelihood of transmission from one human being to another, an aerosolized uh, transmission it was just really different. And we didn't know that in early 2020. Nobody knew that. And there was no, you know, that's the kind of thing, if we had a really great public health infrastructure, the sorts of tests that would give you that answer mm -hmm. would be done mm -hmm. right away. Mm -hmm. Let me just give you, if I may, mm -hmm. a sidestep for a second. In, in the anthrax out, uh, mailings, we had a situation where Envelopes were showing up at senator's office, let's say, or the anchor of uh, network news. And somebody, not the targeted name, but an assistant of some sort, was opening that envelope and out spilled white spores. According to the only studies that anybody had at the time, those white spores... And who did these studies? U.S. military. In what context? When we still had a biological warfare program. Mm. Um, so it's before Nixon. So they would open it and they, and they said, well, you know, one random spore won't do anything to a human being. You have to have a minimum dose of 10,000 spores. Can you imagine quantifying this? And, and imagining that every single air space would have the same ratio of number of spores per person and blah, blah, blah. And of course, now we know that, you know, one person, an elderly woman in Connecticut died probably because of a single spore on the outside of an envelope of a mail order catalog that just happened to be sorted through the same mail sorting machine simultaneously with an envelope that contained anthrax one little spore, you know, came out of one little corner of that envelope and got on her mail order catalog. So we, we, it turns out that we didn't do any good research here in the United States at the time in a useful fashion that could say how dangerous actually is anthrax? How does it aerosolize in an airspace? Um, and then, of course, when we found out it was all spreading in the mail sorting system of the U.S. Postal Service, nobody really got in there in a timely fashion and said, oh, my God, how do you not spread spores through the U.S. mail? Um, but, it, but the Canadians took a different tack. In Canada, the second they heard the word anthrax, uh, they did a, a series of excellent studies using... Uh, a type of sporulating bacterium that's very similar to anthrax, but is not toxic to human beings and had an individual in totally controlled room, controlled airspace, everything, open envelope, set envelope down, sit still, wait for a given amount of time, then do your analysis of the room. And they were able to show, even if you do everything according to FBI instructions, open carefully, immediately, set it down, remain completely still. Anthrax fills the entire airspace and remains circulating in that airspace for days, posing a threat. Well, we never did anything like that for COVID. We're only beginning to see the kinds of studies that could really explain um, COVID transmission. And uh, 
you know, the assertion you should wear a mask or you shouldn't wear a mask were all based on kind of loose epidemiological mm -hmm. studies, not on really hardcore experimental analysis of the spread of um, the virus itself. And now with the Delta variant and evidence that it's far more transmissible, what exactly biologically does that mean? Is it far more transmissible because it can recirculate in the air? Is it far more transmissible because it happens to have a specific genetic change that gives it a random possibility escalation of latching on to an ACE2 receptor effectively? You know, I, I don't I don't think we have any idea. No, hard experiments to do also, especially in a pandemic. <laughs> with a BSL-3 agent. So, uh, you know, we're not going to get answers anytime soon to any of that. I think it's hard. Um, in one of your chapters, you quote Joe McCormick in 1993. He says, I don't even recognize the CDC anymore. It's a bunch of politicized pencil pushers who make all the decisions without ever hitting the ground, never going into the field, never seeing things up close. Is that still the case, you think? Yeah. <laughs> In fact, actually, the poor CDC, you know, every time there's something major that happens that suddenly draws White House concern and congressional attention, mm -hmm. um, there's another reinvention of the CDC. Uh, probably the single most radical restructuring of the CDC came after anthrax because then the Bush administration said, you know, this has to be part of the national security apparatus. And a lot of military personnel uh, and FBI were stationed inside CDC. For a lot of the bench scientists who saw the CDC as a kind of combination of disease detectives and basic research, it was an impossible cultural shift. And um, I think when H1N1 hit in 2009, it happened to come uh, when Obama had only been president for three months. And he had tried to make Tom Daschle head of HHS, uh, but there was a scandal and he had to withdraw Daschle's nomination, so he had no Secretary of Health. And the um, CDC director had resigned, but there was no permanent CDC director. And most of the key posts inside of HHS that are nominations had not been filled. So we went into the swine flu outbreak of 2009 running blind and uh, for the CDC, it was uh, very difficult. Fortunately, they had an individual who rose to the challenge as acting director, Richard Besser, and did a very good job of public communication about the epidemic and was able to, to steer the ship. But that led to another set of, you know, changes. And so they were in the process of making these big changes coming out of 2010. And then along comes Ebola and in 2014 and the Obama administration does another whole set of giant mega changes and let's alter CDC this way. And by the way, each time they politicians decide that the CDC has to be reinvented, they also want to reinvent WHO. And WHO is constantly being called upon to go undergo reform. Uh, you're hearing it loud and clear right now. And uh, similarly, all these things end up simply being disruptions mm. that rarely have any positive outcome when you get finally out the whole chain of events. So you've been, you were pretty critical of Redfield, right? You think, um, well, what, what are some of the things that he did wrong? As CDC director or yeah, before? Yeah, as, as CDC director. Well, I think it's pretty clear that Redfield was walking a uh, 
a line between being a Trump loyalist yeah. and being the leader of the nation's public health institution. And that it was a very uncomfortable line for him. Um, he, you know, is it, all you have to do is look right after the inauguration on January 20th, uh, 2020, I mean, excuse me, 2021, you see this huge flood of CDC publications about COVID. I mean, just huge. The Morbidity Mortality Weekly Report, New England Journal of Medicine, Lancet, everywhere you turn. Now, this wasn't because just suddenly they wrote papers. This was a backlog that had been, you know, damned by the director's office when Redfield was in leadership because they were inconvenient findings that contradicted stuff that was being said by the insane brigade inside of the Oval Office. You think we're better off now? Yes, we are better off. Are we where we need to be? No. But, but we do have, you know, some semblance of science back in the driver's seat down in Atlanta. And, uh, I think morale has suffered deeply, hmm. uh, not just at the CDC, but across the board in public health. And that's not going to easily snap back into place. Uh, and I, you know, it's interesting. You, I'm sure all of you have seen this in your respective institutions, but, you know, when there's a crisis, there's a certain kind of young person who says, you know, I want to be part of fighting the next time a crisis like this happens. And so you see applications to schools of public health skyrocket in times like this. Everybody wants to be in global health. Everybody wants to be a public, and they are so eager and so dedicated, these kids, when they walk in the door of their school of public health or their microbiology department, where they really wanna be in the front lines of conquering the next outbreak and, and so on. And something happens, you know, from that point until they go through their first or second job that just seems to suck the life out of them. And I think it's uh, in part a question of whether we're training kids with the right skill set in public health and all the other things we've previously talked about in this podcast about, you know, what it actually feels like to be in a power structure where anything about public health is at the bottom of the heap. You mentioned that uh, you were in China for for SARS one, right? And you saw that you saw it being um, lied about. And of course, at some point, they couldn't lie anymore because it got out, right? <laughs> Do you think there was similar hiding going on at the beginning of uh, the COVID nineteen outbreak? Well, you know, in December of 2019, just before Christmas, I started seeing hints of things that were making my skin crawl and were reminding me of similar stuff I was seeing in 2002, uh, just before finally SARS was publicly known and China was forced to admit that there was a crisis. And, and it was a combination of local um, local news things out of China and the Chinese political response. So if I can, I mean, I thought one of your very, very best of these 700 some podcasts you've done was done recently with um, Bob Gary, where you were talking about the whole debate about the origins of uh, SARS-CoV-2 and I felt all along, and I'm, I'm trying to write this up halfway decently right now. Um, I felt all along that a lot of people who really have no idea what they're talking about, including scientists, are mouthing off about the origins of this epidemic as if they actually know 
what life is like in China, as if they actually have a clue of what a wet market is like. And they've actually been inside of them. And they've actually been in the Burmese rainforest and seen these bats in flight. And they actually understand the relationship between these bat species and various intermediary potential host species and so on. And they've actually been in a BSL-3 lab and on and on and on. And most of them, it's zero on all of the above, right? So if you'll indulge me, in 2003, uh, shortly after the new year, I arrived in Hong Kong and was um, immediately trying to understand what all this rumored stuff was across the river in Shenzhen and, and Guangdong. Dong province, Guangzhou specifically, and then also what was going on inside Hong Kong and Vietnam, Singapore, Thailand, where these outbreaks were. Um, and I got a tip off pretty quickly from uh, a now well-known virologist who probably would prefer that I maintain the promised confidentiality, um, that if I could as an American citizen managed to get my way into Guangzhou, um, just jump on a train and hope you get there, um, that I would find there was a gigantic wet market. It was several blocks in size and that that was almost certainly where the whole outbreak started. So I, uh, I did so. And um, unlike in this case, when uh, I think correctly, the authorities responded to the outbreak in Wuhan with swift closure of the uh, wet market. In uh, Guangzhou, the wet market was, market was still alive and well, and you got a really clear idea of what the conditions were for potential transmission. And I, I mean, if you haven't traveled a lot in Asia and spent some time shopping for food, <laughs> you've probably no idea what this is like. But it was obviously an apparent, and you could just see it, the whole chain of transmission, how it arose, where SARS 2003 came from. Um, smugglers were uh, stealing wildlife from all over the world. The major ch uh, chain then and now is the highway that was built as a superhighway in a uh, the first stage of what is now called the Belt and Road, but it didn't have that name back then. Um, connecting China to seaports uh, far flung, not on Chinese soil, and essentially allowing a kind of expansion of the Chinese empire. In this case, it was a super highway that went from Yunnan down through the rainforest of northern Burma and ultimately to the Yangon so that they could have uh, sea access on a completely different side from China, right? And with the rumor of huge amounts of oil reserves discovered in those waters, China wanted a piece of that action. And the Burmese military was more than happy to, you know, wash hands together on that. Well, that highway cut right through one of the greatest, densest rainforests on earth. Uh, and one that was relatively pristine. However, it was also one full of crime because uh, from the ground there, you can get emeralds and rubies uh, and other rare gems and gold. And uh, it's also the opium trail for smuggling uh, opium out of the fields elsewhere in Burma, Thailand, and so on. And so uh, it's a very dangerous area to begin with. And then there was an active civil war going on up in the, with certain tribal groups against the Burmese ethnic group. And uh, so China built this super highway. And what was going on was all these smugglers that were connected to the highway construction who were Chinese would go off on little side roads off the highway into the rainforest and grab whatever looked, you know, interesting. And then sell them in the large city in Yunnan, from there they would get smuggled up to the wet markets all over China. And so you had this very active trade going on. And by the way, it's worth billions. It's not like some little wimpy guys are making a few hundred bucks here and there. Some of the animals would then be farmed. They would figure out how to treat them almost like livestock and grow them, get them to reproduce. An example of that would be raccoon cats, civets, um, a whole range of different sort of 
animals that are on the interface between, uh, they're mammals, they're woolly mammals, but they're small and many of them are actually rodents. Um, and then uh, they would have uh, these animals sold in what I saw in the market in Guangzhou is you have an aisle like, you know, aisle one, amphibians, aisle two, reptiles, aisle three, antelopes, you know, and so on. But also you have smugglers that will co-house different species and they'll have them in cages. These are terrified animals that are doing all the things that terrified animals do, you know, uh, passing a lot of uh, urine and excrement, uh, salivating and biting and snarling. And, you know, they're in cages and then they'll just stack the cages. So you have species one here, species two here, species three here. This one's urinating down on this one, on this one, on this one. They're salivating down on each other. It's like you couldn't come up with a better way to mix viruses around and to have things jump from host to host. And then to my astonishment, I'm in the middle of the civet dealers. We now know civets were the primary intermediary host between bats and humans. For SARS, the way they would clean the wet market um, a couple of times a day. And by the way, the workers in the wet market were mostly barefoot, walking around in mountains of animal everything. And they would come through with these fire hoses and just, and that would aerosolize everything. <laughs> so the whole market would just be a mist of everything that was in the excrement and the saliva and the whatever. And that would all kind of circulate for a while until it settled. And then they'd do it again a few hours later. And uh, we now know the civets were uh, our, our preferred or were then a preferred food for humans to eat at the dawn of the winter to ironically fend off respiratory infections. It's a traditional Cantonese thing. And you would go to certain restaurants that would specialize in uh, preparing wild animals for consumption. And so the actual slaughtering of these civets was occurring in a back alley behind this one particular restaurant. And on the other side of the alley was a dormitory for migratory workers from rural China, including some of the guys that were working in that kitchen of that restaurant. And the, their, rest, their windows were open and the civets were being slaughtered right there outside their windows in the alleyway and then served to their customers. Uh, man, it's just it's just ideal for transmission. And when I was advising on the movie Contagion, I kept saying we got to recreate this scene. So you do see Gwyneth Paltrow being in a restaurant. You don't see the animals slaughtered because that was just too gross for Hollywood. But you get the idea. <laughs> do these markets still exist in China? Well, you know, uh, what happened, of course, with SARS, once... So the political backdrop on all this really in a nutshell is by pure coincidence, the very, very first case in Foshan that we know of, of SARS in November 2002, happened to occur the same day or he sought hospital care the same day that the um, political leadership of the Communist Party was in their closed door meeting to choose a successor to Jiang Zemin. And they decided on Hu Jintao. Um, and they also decided that they were determined that this would be the first transition of power in China without bloodshed, without any party factions going after each other. And so there was a sort of edict. Nothing can rock the boat until the whole thing would be formally certified in March of 2003. So you're going to go from November to March. And in March... The People's Party Congress will convene and, you know, several thousand people in an auditorium will all vote. Yay, who should tell? And then he's formally the new head of the country. So SARS is spreading during that interim. And uh, it's got to be covered up. It's got to be not true. It's got to be not spreading. It's got to be not a problem because we can't have anything shake up this very delicate transition of power. Um, but. There were telltale signs even in that one during that massive cover-up time, because of course it spread to neighbor countries. So we all knew there was SARS. 
but there were telltale signs domestically that it was spreading. And, and the key giveaway was a certain kind of uh, vinegar that, again, is in Cantonese culture used to treat respiratory infections. And that vinegar comes from way up in Shanxi in Taiwan. So I went to Taiwan and Shanxi and I traced the whole path of the uh, vinegar sales and the Communist Party boss who got SARS, went to Beijing, lied about what was wrong with him, demanded medical care. His driver dies of it. He is deathly ill, survives, but infects an entire hospital. He's a super spreader. And that was the origin of this massive explosion in Beijing. But I saw all this cover up every single step, cover up for political reasons, cover up for greed reasons, because this communist party boss also had controlling interests in the vinegar trade, cover up, you know, for international political and foreign policy reasons, lying to WHO, everything. It was, uh, it was all there. So long way of getting back to your question. So I'm sitting there in December, 2019, and I'm seeing the same stuff. It looks to me SARS all over again or something very much like SARS. And, um, you know, when the Li Wenliang repression happened, he and his six colleagues, uh, physicians, trying to call attention to an unusual rate of pneumonia death, um, it, I just said, okay, this is SARS. If it's not SARS, it's something just like it. I've seen this game before. I've been in the middle of this playbook. I recognize it. And then as soon as the government said it looked like it was the Hanan wet market and they closed the wet market, you back to your question, why was the wet market even open in the first place? Because back in 2003, once China had to concede, yes, we are the source of this terrible disease, they vowed to the world to shut all the wet markets. And they did for about six months. You know, and to be fair, in Asia, first of all, a lot of people don't have refrigerators. There isn't a culture of going to the supermarket and buying a chicken that's already chopped up and plucked. Um, and it's a lot more than just chickens and ducks. I mean, it's every kind of species you can imagine. So can you give some other examples of what types of things you were seeing in December, 2019? I find that really interesting. What those things that made your skin crawl could have been. Yeah, well, um, when the, so the government in Wuhan, the actual government infrastructure, didn't actually start reporting anything about the epidemic until Li Wenliang's uh, e -po uh, internet posting kind of went global. And so it's actually New Year's Eve, our time, that the government says, okay, you know, she, yes, we do have a little bit of a pneumonia problem and it's not flu. Um, but, you know, it's all about this animal market and we have shut the market down. So it's all over. Nothing to worry about. Don't look behind the curtain. There's nothing happening here. And that to me was right away. OK, that's just way too pat. There's there's no way that's true. Um, what I had seen in 2003 told me whatever's in the wet market is out of the wet market really fast. So there, and that was before we had the paper that showed definitively that the transmissions, even in early December, were largely independent of the wet market. Um, but the second thing that really got to me was as soon as they started reporting official numbers of deaths and hospitalizations, the numbers weren't consistent from day to day. Some days they actually went backwards so that the cumulative total decreased. And that to me felt exactly like the number manipulation stuff I had seen. And then the fact that the information was not coming from the federal CDC in Beijing, the information that was released and even what was sent to WHO was coming from the local CDC in, uh, in Wuhan at Hubei. And it was clearly massaged and controlled 
at the local level. That again reminded me of SARS because in 2003, the Guangdong and Guangzhou CDCs and health departments refused to even let the Minister of Health from Beijing, when he flew in, see the data. So you had conflicting struggle within the Communist Party. And then uh, I was following the state council meetings, uh, you know, which is the most powerful body of power in uh, China. And there was a key state council meeting where Xi Jinping said to the state council, uh, I'm not believing the crap coming out of Wuhan. Uh, something's out of control there. I'm firing the mayor. I'm firing the party boss. I'm firing the governor of uh, Hebei. I'm bringing in my pal I trust from Shanghai to take over here. And this buddy I like a lot from Beijing is heading down to take over there. And uh, I personally want to start seeing this data. And that told me that, again, it was just like the provincial versus federal fight that had occurred previously. And I guess the last thing was um, uh, the symptomology was so severe. And I was seeing a lot of uh, videos that were courageously posted by Chinese people. Um, most of them, not reporters, not professionals necessarily, but people who were outraged by what they were seeing. And at one, one video in particular, I remember really got to me because it was this a, a physician screaming at a colleague and she was really distraught. She was in tears. This I think was the first week of January, really in tears, um, screaming, you know, they want us to take, to process all these bodies but where are we going to put all these bodies? The crematorium is already overwhelmed and she's surrounded by wrapped bodies in this room. And she's just, and I say, okay, that's it. This isn't even SARS. This is, this is off the charts. Something huge is going on here. What, what's your thought about the origin? Do you think it was in Wuhan in a market or somewhere else? Yeah. So <laughs> I knew you were probably going to force me to take a position on this one. <laughs> um, you know, there's hard. I, let me say one thing. I The first really large mega piece I did that came out as the cover story of New Republic at the end of March 2020, I said the catastrophe really is that the two most powerful people on the planet are Xi Jinping and Donald Trump and they will screw this up. And here's all the ways in which they are gonna ruin the response to this disease. And uh, indeed, you know, Trump goes from, as we all now notoriously know, he goes from, my friend Xi told me, there's nothing to worry about. We were hanging out in Davos, the World Economic Forum. He said he's got the whole thing under control. And we've only had 15 cases in America. It's only 15. Nobody's died. So what's the big deal? And he goes from that to this is the Wuhan virus. This is the China virus. China made this. They sent it to us. They lied to us. It's not my fault Americans are dying. It's Xi Jinping's fault that Americans are dying. Um, so... The whole uh, it came out of the lab scenario is suspect to me um, for political reasons. It, it was clearly used as a way to deflect blame and concern regarding the Trump response. But that doesn't mean that it's a whole 100 percent BS. So what can we what can we say about the science and what can we say about other coronavirus emergences that helps us understand where this might have come from. You know, to this day, we don't know exactly how long MERS has been in camels. We don't know the full range of dromedaries and camel species that are afflicted with MERS whether in some camel species it's a deadly experience. And for most, it appears to be a fairly benign virus to the camel. We don't know how it got from an Egyptian tomb bat to a camel and when that happened. 
um, we, we still have a lot of gaps in our knowledge of how humans get it from the camels. Um, there was a ban on camel milk drinking. That didn't seem to stop the uh, spread. And then, of course, we know it's a just like SARS, it's a horrible nosocomial transmitter. I mean, you have a sloppy hospital, you will have spread within the hospital. So there's definitely, you know, virulent, rampant human to human transmission under the right circumstances. But just because we don't know how it got in camels and when it got in camels and how it goes from camels to humans and what particular bat may have passed it to a camel doesn't mean it was all made in a laboratory in Riyadh. And, you know, we're this, the first known Ebola outbreak is 1976. That's a long time ago. And we still can't really say exactly what bat species are the primary reservoir for Ebola and exactly how it jumps from that, from bats in rare cases to primates and how humans get it from the primates. That doesn't mean Ebola was made in a laboratory. In every outbreak I've ever been in, every single one, there is a conspiracy theory about the CIA. Um, I remember my favorite, most convoluted conspiracy theory I ever ran into, which was actually the dominant narrative at the time in India, it was 1994 with, when uh, pneumonic plague broke out in uh, Surat. It had started as bubonic in Maharashtra and then human carriers took it up into Gujarat and it coincided with, I forget the name of that, elephant-headed god. Um, oh, yes. That's the big, the G- big celebration. Ganesh, Ganesh. Ganesh, thank you. The big Ganesh celebration. People densely crowded up the riverbanks to throw their Ganeshas into the sea. They were throwing the Ganeshas in, and that's when people got exposed, and you suddenly had this explosion of uh, plague. Well, Okay, this isn't the 14th century. We can prophylactically treat people with tetracycline, the cheapest darn antibiotic, and nobody has to die of plague. Um, But the response and reaction in India was just overwhelming. I mean, I couldn't believe the things I was seeing. And every single corner of the country was claiming to have plague cases, and people were hysterical. And the dominant narrative was that Keep in mind the year 1994, so it's not long after the collapse of the Soviet Union. So the big, you know, all the big newspapers were were running this story that um, the CIA had moved in on the Vector Lab in Siberia. And in collaboration with former Soviet scientists, they had made this extra special super duper strain of plague. And then they had given it to Pakistanis who deliberately released it in Maharashtra in a convoluted plot for which not only is there no evidence, but you can't even figure out like, so why would they have done that? What was supposed to have been accomplished? Um, So having said that every single epidemic I've ever been in, there's a conspiracy theory and there are crazy notions of security personnel doing, you know, making things in secret laboratories and all this kind of stuff. Um, It didn't surprise me in the least that the Wuhan Institute of Virology would become part of a Pompeo Trump conspiracy theory. Um, I think the WHO grossly mishandled the investigation. They delayed it too long. They set up the wrong kind of team to go in there. They had one team member with a clear conflict of interest. um, And they didn't, you know, if the point was to somehow get smoking gun evidence, they didn't set up an agreement with China that could have possibly resulted in that, nor would China under any circumstances agree to such a thing any more than we would. Would we allow outsiders from another nation, particularly a nation with which we had hostile dealings, walk into the headquarters of Pfizer and start looking for smoking guns? Of course not. In fact, much ignored, 
in all this debate is that the United States has been the major force refusing uh, all global efforts to strengthen the Biological Weapons Convention, specifically on the grounds of not wanting to allow any foreign inspectors on U.S. soil to go into U.S. pharmaceutical or academic laboratories under any circumstances, full stop. We're on record through every president since uh, since Reagan saying we refuse to comply with anything that expands the power and the ability to enforce the Biological Weapons Convention. So now we're going to turn around and say we want China to do the same that we've refused. We would never let Chinese scientists inspect U.S. AMRID. We're not going to let a whole pile of Chinese investigators go through the CDC, right? But we're insisting we want them to allow us to do that for probably we'll start with the Wuhan Institute of Virology. And if they don't find smoking guns there, then they'll demand access to 10 more labs and 10 more locations. I don't see an end game here. I don't see an end game. And, you know, each little scientific permutation, like this latest one uh, that involves the possibility of, uh, what is it, 25 missing genomes, not logged into the official database that are now in the official database, by the way. Um, and doesn't that show an attempt to cover up and hide? Each one of these things um, to me is just a distraction. It doesn't get us to any core place that is useful. If the end game is pure politics, then all it's going to do is continue to worsen tensions between our two nations and I've been in dozens of hours of high-level meetings with Beijing officials, Shanghai officials, and um, I have seen over the last year and a half the mood in these meetings shift to the point where, we, well, we can't even meet anymore. It's not even possible. Um, and as China has cracked down on Hong Kong, the major conduit of decent conversation the way to have rapprochement, if you will, and scientific collaboration has essentially been destroyed. Um, you know, if you're at the University of Hong Kong, it's not in your interest right now to be on the open telephone call with a scientist from the United States. And, uh, you know, if the goal is a humane one, it is, let us, for the future of other outbreaks, have better understanding of how this one arose so that we're better prepared in the future. We already know how outbreaks arise. It's not a great mystery. Now, there might be some fine detail, like we sure would like to know what the intermediary host was. And we'd like to confirm if it did come from the Burmese forest on the, the Yunnan superhighway, then you know, that might lead us to some really serious issues about the Belt and Road and the expansion of the Chinese, you know, trade in wildlife. If it really did come from pangolins, you know, that's more reason to shut down the international trade in pangolins. But I doubt we're now going to know the kind of scientific answers that would really be meaningful. And we're only now in a political game. Seems to me that, um, yeah, as you said, we know how these things spill over. You're not going to shut down all the markets. You're not going to avoid farmers hitting guano for their fields. But you could be ready with antivirals, for example, which we could have been after SARS-1, right? So why why can't we invest in this? When there's no SARS-1, we forget it and that and that's it? You know, the thing... I'd be curious if you agree with me, but I've always felt, and I mean, I'm going back to the 80s. I have always felt that the thing that we needed was shown to us on Star Trek. And it was the the little, what did they call it? The tricorder. Tricorder. Yep. You are, you're infected with this virus. You know. Yeah, yeah. And every year we get closer in terms of, you know, bench science. Um you know, I always I thought the Oxford nanopore was going to take us right over the hump there, you know, <laughs> um, that once we really understood sequencing and we could look for conserved sequences and have platforms for screening for conserved sequences, we wouldn't even need to know 
anything more than vaguely the family that the virus belonged to, we wouldn't have to know any more specifics than that. But to just say, you know, something that looks like a filovirus is in this guy in the ICU right now. You know, the fact that epidemic after epidemic after epidemic, the lack of proper surveillance tools and diagnostics has been a rate limiting step. It has forced the use of imprecise symptomatic um, discrimination to determine who was infected and who wasn't, which then leads to all the politics of how dare you accuse me and how, you know, and I hate those people over there. So they must be the carriers and let's restrict these people, but not those people. And none of it's about science. And I, you know, if I had a magic wand to wave, I would sit down with the president of the United States and say, Mr. President, I, I really appreciate your war on cancer effort. And, you know, we've been there before, but maybe this time we'll do better. But honestly, the biggest bang for buck right now is a standardized set of surveillance and diagnostic tools where the sensitivity and specificity and all of that is true across the platform where we don't have one, you know, argument about whether or not something was actually found in a sample and that it's designed to be used by people the way we use a car, which is to say, you don't have to know how it works. You just got to know how to turn the button on and punch it the way you're supposed to punch it and do what you're supposed to do with the data that comes out of it so that it can be given to field workers in the Sahel to inspectors in wet markets in Burma, to food inspectors in Vietnam, and to uh, folks out in the Amazon in, in Brazil, and everybody can see what is arising and send off alerts up the system. Um, and we can know who the carriers are, whether it's animals or humans, and how it's being transmitted quickly. But Never. We just never see. We see lab after lab saying we've invented something that's along that highway, but we never see the money come in and really make it happen. And we never see commercialization. Even now, I mean, the first supposed lab test for COVID diagnostic test was what, February 2020. Right. We still don't have a standardized diagnostic. You know, I can I can go out with my antigen test. I can get FDA approval, and I don't have to demonstrate that I have sensitivity and specificity that's better than the guy down the street selling his test kit. So we still are this far down the road, and we don't have an agreed scientific definition of infection, an agreed scientific definition of prior infection, and a, an agreed scientific uh, definition of infectiousness. For humans. And then we start talking about pet cats and pet dogs and lions and tigers in the zoo and blah, blah, blah. We don't have anything. I mean, this is ridiculous. But I mean, you're right. But then we then after that, we need therapeutics, which we don't have really. And but you know, bang for the buck. Rapid surveillance and diagnostics is the front line. And the fact that we just never I mean, it's all about profit. It's all about profit. You know, when you come up with a platform that works, where's the reimbursement mechanism? I remember sitting in a meeting with a group of people from hospitals saying they would, and I was asking them, why don't you do a solidified single uh, platform so that I, you draw blood from me instead of drawing one tube for this test, one tube for that test, one tube for da, 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 da at least for the sense of infectious agents and pathogens, why don't you have a single battery test? And the answer was because the reimbursement cycle is test by test. And there is no reimbursement cycle for a a generalized platform. Well, duh, that's, you know, that's president says to Medicare and Medicaid, hey, fix this. So I've thought that, if we could have something like we have with the military where since whenever, you know, they're supposed to be able to fight a war in two theaters simultaneously or whatever, couldn't we have a war or a, or a, a public health military, if you will, with a budget to back it up 
to be prepared for this and to fight and have the diagnostics and all that that you're pointing to who how can we how can we make that i mean it seems so apparent to me and it seems like it would be apparent after a pandemic but i'm afraid that it's just we're just going to go back and there'll be some tweak to the cdc and public health for a while and then it we won't be any farther along you know, I had this great conversation about four months ago with uh, Jeremy Farrar, who runs uh, the Wellcome Trust in the UK. We were we were brainstorming about this, and um, I mean, we're we're on the cusp of a kind of scientific revolution that, in theory, could have us have the upper hand for the first time against unknown pathogens, because. What the mRNA vaccine has shown is that you can make a template and it's ready to rock and roll. Just plug in the genome that you want to target and boom, off you go. And in theory, we could have mRNA vaccine manufacturing capacity, you know, set up online, you know, multiple pharmaceutical companies ready to rock and roll. And it's just first guy out of the chute with a genome sequence, off you go, right? Now, that at, couple that with CRISPR and the possibility of being able to really ch- slice and dice genomic samples on a rapid basis and get a clear idea of what your epitopes are, what you know, what is your immune system targeting, uh, and what is the virus targeting, so that you you know now we look at the spike protein of the coronavirus and and various changes being made in nature as it circulates in human beings and variants show up with various attributes. But we, we, we knew way back last February, 2020, that the spike protein was the name of the game. And people were already you know, synthesizing based on it to come up with the proper targeting for a vaccine. But why wasn't that also in the same rapid sense of urgency using that as a template for rapid diagnostics and surveillance tools. And, you know, I, just to give you an example of how frustrated I get about this question, way back, God, at least four years ago, um, I got very excited about Oxford Nanopore once they figured out a way to take their thumb-sized, you know, device into the field. And they took it into the uh, Ebola epidemic in 2015 and were able to make positive diagnosis based on, without having to go to a laboratory. So, I mean, from the point of view of places like Sub-Saharan Africa, eliminating the necessity for laboratory verification is an extraordinary step towards hastening your response and controlling an outbreak. Um, the fact I, I saw in 2014 um, delays of up to two weeks that simply involved managing to get a sample out of a village all the way to over here to a lab and then process it in the lab and then take the information about who was infected back to the village. By then they're all dead and they've spread it to multiple other people. If we can, you know, so I thought with Oxford Nanopore, oh boy, this is this is going to be it. We're going to get that company to be focused on this question of rapid identification of previously unknown and known microorganisms that are potentially pathogenic, right? So, meanwhile, this, we were hitting the countdown on eradication of polio, and I was in multiple meetings where. The Gates Foundation was making it pretty clear that they were in the game to eradicate polio, but not necessarily for what comes next. And what comes next is polio is in the environment somewhere because we've seen it recur in uh, show up in the sewage systems in Israel, in Australia, in New Zealand, in places that had long since eradicated polio. So what the heck? We don't know. But it means that after you so-called eradicated it, you're going to have to have environmental surveillance. So, OK, if you're going to do something, the equivalent of, you know, a nanopore type device that going through sewage samples in uh, Kabul and, uh, you know, Islamabad 
um, then uh, why just look for polio, this tiny RNA virus? As long as you can find that, why not do a whole screen of multiple viruses? And while you're at it, you know, the key enteric bacterial disease uh, issues, right? So let's just get out there and for the first time have some idea of what's going through human beings in these population centers. Uh, I could never get anybody interested in funding anything like that. And now we do see with COVID some success in doing sewage sampling to determine whether COVID is in circulation and whether people are passing it. That's you know, an interesting step, but it still is only basically, uh, you know, research science. It's not really a new institutional step for public health. And, you know, for, if I could take this whole conversation back to where we started, I would say, you know, public health needs more respect and it needs a better toolkit. And the toolkit potential is there. We, it's not that crazy. I mean, Jeremy Farrar is saying we could get it down to, certainly a hundred day timetable from first emergence of a microbe to vaccine is available. We could get it down to say 30 days. And that would include having a surveillance tool, having a diagnostic tool and having the beginnings of a vaccine. Um, there's, there's, the only thing that's in the way is the kind of commitment that would make it real and that would put the dollars where they need to go and would set the research priorities appropriately rather than the research priorities being set by what the board of directors of pharmaceutical company X and Y think is the greatest profit return direction. There you go. All right, Brianne, do you have a final question? I think I'm good. How about you, uh, Kathy? I, I, I'm fine too. Thanks. All right, I have one more then, and then we'll let you go. So there's a huge inequity globally. We have great vaccines here, but, you know, Africa, less than 2%. What do, how does that get fixed and who fixes it? Well, are you speaking specifically about COVID? Yeah, or are just you asking co I mean, it's, obviously it's a broader issue, but I'm interested in COVID because the, the pandemic's not over until it's over in every country. So how can that be addressed? We, we actually now see a surge uh, second wave surge in Africa. Mm -hmm. The first wave was pretty mild. I know a lot of different theories are out there about why it was mild. I personally think it's demographics. Africa is the most youthful continent on earth. And I've been in many countries in Africa where uh, the mean age is under 21. Uh, so we know in its original form, the Wuhan virus was a pretty mild virus for people, uh, you know, under 50 and it got worse and worse the older you got and you're looking at societies where the very finite pool demographically uh, was over 60 years of age um, now we're there's increasing evidence you know, Tony Fauci was actually talking about this at the White House yesterday that the Delta variant in particular uh, is actually really hitting hard against young adults and may also be hitting harder on children, um, that it's certainly wildly more transmissible. I was in one meeting where they were throwing around an RO of seven, perhaps even eight for the Delta variant, which is, you know, it's not quite measles 12 to 20, but it's up there. It's not, you know, 1918 flu was an RO of one, maybe one point something, you know? Um, so this is this would be startling. Um, and so, you know, I was in a meeting with two top African officials earlier this week where they were saying if this Delta variant sweeps across the African continent and you, the rest of the world, don't get vaccine to us, you're going to watch us die. You're going to stand by and watch us perish. Uh, and when you look at the the numbers, I mean, uh, last I looked, it was 0.76% of Africans had been vaccinated and less than 2% of the global supply of vaccines had gone to the African continent. It's not a heck of a lot better if you're looking at Southeast Asia, if you're looking at Latin America, um, you know, the whole Southern hemisphere is getting screwed outside of Australia and New Zealand. So, uh, how do we fix this? 
in in January uh, 2020 at uh, the Doha, I mean uh, Davos meeting of the World Economic Forum, uh, a, a wonderful cluster of key players from World Bank, WHO, Gavi, the Gates Foundation, uh, the Wellcome Trust, uh, uh, a few key pharmaceutical companies sat down and said, we're going to make a way to do this. And we're not going to see what happened in 2009 with H1N1 be repeated. Just to remind everybody, most of the world didn't see vaccine in, against H1N1 until the epidemic was over. We hoarded it in the wealthy countries and Africa didn't get any doses at all until it had come and gone as an epidemic. So and given the, that that was a mild pathogen and COVID is far more serious pathogen, could this be fixed? So they set up COVAX, co-vaccine, uh, the idea being a single repository of uh, supplies of vaccine to be managed basically by Gavi and UNICEF, um, funded by the wealthy world. S a certain percentage of all vaccines being produced everywhere would go into this common pile and then be dispersed from there, along with everything that makes vaccination possible, syringes and alcohol swabs and uh, you know refrigeration devices and so on. And it was, you know, the, this group thought we can make this happen. We can't. This time will be different. This time will bring equity to the field. And I mean, they're all very crushed to see what has actually happened. Uh, one uh, estimate I saw came out of uh, the uh, African Union. African Union actually set aside $2 billion for purchase of vaccine. This isn't for lack of resources this time. They have money, but every contract signed for vaccines is signed for the rich world. You know, in some rich world countries, particularly Canada, it gets pointed out, have signed enough contracts to vaccinate every single citizen nine times. Full course vaccination nine times over. The United States has signed enough contracts to surely vaccinate every single man, woman, and child in America several times over. So have most of the Northern European countries. Um, we, can't, we can't have a situation where uh, the African Union is saying, here's $2 billion. Come on, guys. Here's the cash. Send us the vaccine and Pfizer, Moderna, AstraZeneca, you name the company. And they're all saying, look, I'm sorry, I'd love to help you guys, but we got these other contracts to deal with. And, um, you know, we can't break the deals. Uh, we don't have a world order. We don't have a global governance system. Uh, and by the way, this then gets even worse if you ask who's controlling distribution of syringes Who's controlling uh, the recycling or appropriate uh, disposal of syringes uh, so that we don't have kids poking themselves, playing on uh, garbage heaps? Who's dealing with um, the whole supply chain of nucleoside analogs, of uh, you know, <clears throat> polymerases and RNases and all the various things that are necessary to make both uh, diagnostic tests, nucleic acid tests, certainly, and um, vaccines. There's no rational order there at all. When you hear the given vaccine company <coughs> is having trouble meeting its production quota, it's often because of upstream chemicals and upstream, uh, you know, biologics that they can't get their hands on. Um, and so this fantasy that now I think I think it's a fantasy that WHO is in of, well, we'll encourage construction of a giant vaccine production capacity in South Africa to offset all this. They're still going to have to get supplies. And I, you know, if Pfizer can't guarantee a steady chain of essential supplies to make their vaccine, why do we think a company with far less power and resources sitting in the middle of Pretoria is going to be able to do so? Um, so 
It's, it's gone far beyond the question of who owns the patents, far beyond all these simplistic political issues that get raised with a lot of hand waving and screaming. This is about global order and humanity, and we have neither expressed in the context of how we're controlling or not or failing to control COVID. All right. On that note, Lori Garrett, thank you so much for joining us. It's been great. I'm sorry we ended on such a sad note. I, I, I guess I can always say one thing that leaves us a little happier. <laughs> I do think, and all your virology geek nerd followers, I hope would agree with me completely. I really do think for the first time we are on the cusp of, on the technology side, on the you know, scientific side of this, we are on the cusp of getting to the tricorder. It's not that wild idea anymore. Um, and it's going to be the kids who are in grad school and our postdocs today who are going to get us there. It's their generation that's going to take us over the line. Um, and the fight for those of us that are, you know, too old to be that generation, although Brianna is probably right in there. Uh, but for the rest of us, uh, it's it's got to be about facilitating it, about finding the ways to put political pressure and economic pressure on the necessary institutions to, to give support to translating the bench to commercial production in a way that becomes universal worldwide with some equity, uh, gets into the hands of those who need them, whether they're in the middle of nowhere, uh, you know, Cambodia or, you know, uh, up in the Andes uh, or down in Mississippi, wherever they may be, we have to get the tools in the hands of those who need them. And I think it's doable. I don't think it's a crazy idea. So on that note. That's positive. Great. <laughs> Thank you, Laurie. Thank you, Vincent, and all of you. Thanks for listening to me, Val. It's been Love a it. real honor been to have you here. Pleasure. Thanks. This has been really interesting. Yeah, it was great. I knew better than to put any email in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. Kathy, you have an announcement, an ASV announcement? Yes, I do. We have another town hall coming up in Spanish about vaccines. It's scheduled for Wednesday, June 30th. The recent one was very well attended, and there are still many questions that can be answered. So go to asv.org slash education to sign up. We also have some planned in English as well. If you can't remember asv.org slash education, you can try ASV town halls, vaccine, some combination of words like that in a search window and you'll probably find it. Great. All right, let's wrap this up with some picks of the week. Brianne, what do you have for us? So I have an article that I read in The Atlantic, um, which then uh, was about a study in the New England Journal. Uh, which I also have here. Um, the article in the Atlantic is called a pivotal mosquito experiment could not have gone better. Um, and this is looking at uh, the use of Wolbachia in uh, dengue protection in Indonesia. And this was actually a randomized control trial uh, that was done to look at the effect. And it showed that um, they were able to see a 77% reduction um, in uh, dengue cases in this uh, area of Indonesia where they were uh, investigating. Um, and sort of the, the big picture implications are nicely described as well as sort of the use of Wolbachia and some of that's history in the Atlantic article. And then of course we can look at the data on the uh, randomized control trial, which mm. was the first done uh, for this um, in the New England Journal article that, I, that uh, the Atlantic article was based upon. Cool. That's very cool. Back in June of 2020, no, back in 2019 in December, I was in Singapore and I, I, measured, I visited the Environmental Health Institute where they were also doing a dengue, a Wolbachia mosquito release. And um, they haven't published it, but it's going on in multiple places. So TWIV 630. Yeah, I, I've heard about this, um, these ideas for quite a while um, and actually seeing sort of the randomized control trial, you know, a really nice large yeah. scale trial um, showing that this idea is efficacious is uh, fantastic cool. to see. They actually brought me to the mosquito production facility, right, where they they hatch the mosquitoes from eggs and then they 
separate the males and the females. Um, and they were doing it. They had two glass plates and the, one or the other is bigger than the other. And one flows through <laughs> the plates and the other doesn't. I don't remember which it was. But then they said they had another like flow-based kind of flow-based method they were going to use. But they couldn't tell me about it because it was proprietary. Because they said you need that to do high high numbers, you know. Because you just want to release one or the other. I don't remember. I guess the female you release, right? With Wobot. I think there are different it. models of. Yeah, there's some with males and some with females. I think they were. Do I don't remember yeah. what they were doing. Yes, I I I am glad that you got to visit there. Um, <laughs> I I might stay away from that one um, because I do not like how frequently mosquitoes bite me. <laughs> oh well, Kathy, what do you have for us? I picked uh, a poster that's part of the World Microbe Forum, but it's available to everybody through July 30th of 2021. It's uh, called Microbiology at the Movies, How mm. Microbial Cultures Influenced 130 Years of Human Culture. And it's by our friend, John Warhol, who Vincent picked a long time ago. Um, I think, uh, you know, John has done the periodic table of the microbes and he's the one who got the New Jersey state microbe uh, named and so forth. Mm -hmm. He's just a great guy, but check out this poster. There are film clips going back to the 1800s. He's done a humongous amount of research and it's, it's just really fascinating, uh, really well put together and uh, worth your time to look at about microbiology at the movies. Cool. That sounds awesome. John was on TWIM 181, Dr. Warhol's, Dr. Warhol's Periodic Table of Microbes. Then he made one for viruses too, right? Yeah, I have the virus one. And it, when I get my act together, I'll have it framed and Put behind, it behind me, you. But I don't have it <laughs> Very yet. Very good. My pick is an article in Nautilus by Thomas Levinson, who is a uh, science writing professor at MIT. It's called When a Good Scientist is the Wrong Source. How a bad fact, in quotes, helped the lab leak hypothesis go viral. I told him, not a hypothesis. There's no data for it. Call it a notion or something, but they used hypothesis. Um, it's all about how, you know, David Baltimore saying something, which turned out not to be correct, uh, really changed the dialogue around this lab issue. And um, he, you know, he, we talked last week. And he really, he's very interesting. He understands that the science journalism coverage of the pandemic has been very bad. And I was glad to hear him say that. Um, what did he say about Nicholas Wade? Um, God, he has a quote here, which I thought was brilliant. He said, it's something like he, he, is perv he use, uses persuasive arguments about bad ideas or something like that, you know? Let me see if I can find the word idea. Uh, no, there's five matches. Let's see if I find it. One, two, three, four. Nope. Anyway, that's sort of the idea. Anyway, it's very well written and uh, he's done a lot. He's not a biologist, actually. He covers other fields, but he says that's what happened in science coverage in the past year. Many science writers who don't have anything to do with biology have been recruited, and that can be a problem in itself. Anyway, he's a very interesting fellow. Check it out. All right. That's TWIV773. Show notes are at microbe.tv slash TWIV. Uh, send your questions and comments to TWIV at microbe.tv, and consider supporting us if you like what we do microbe.tv slash contribute. Kathy Spindler is at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks. This is really fun. It was great to have Lori Garrett on. She's terrific. Yeah, the broad yeah. knowledge and wow. th thought about many things and yeah, uh, yeah very it, much enjoyable. And, and not only the Pulitzer Prize, but also a Peabody Award and two Polk Awards. So all of the journalism awards that begin yeah. with P. <laughs> <laughs> And the book is the book is terrific. I have to go read the other one, uh, Betrayal of Trust. You know how um, the the falling apart of the, you know, this is an issue. Global public health is there even such a thing, or does every country kind of do it on their own? Right? I think yeah. that's the right. case, and it shouldn't be. Yeah. Uh, 
Brianne Barker is at Drew University, Bioprof Barker on Twitter. Thanks, Brianne. Thanks. It was great to be here. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.blog. I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology and the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins for the music. This episode of TWIV was recorded, edited, and posted by me, Vincent Racaniello. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>